Hello everyone, my name is uh, Dr. Gishoya. I'm excited today to be speaking to you about fairness in medical algorithms, threats and opportunities. Now, it's going to take, um, it's hard to talk about this topic in 15, min in 15 minutes, but I hope that I can create an appetite for you to be interested in this work. And so, um, I'm an assistant professor at Emory University where I do minimal invasive surgery with interventional radiology. I also do informatics and I work uh, at the HITI lab, which we do uh, work on machine learning. Uh, these are my disclosures, nothing that's going to affect the content of my talk today. Uh, about myself, I am a Kenyan. I actually came to, med to the U.S. Uh, very late and uh, I came in for medical school uh, to specialize in interventional radiology. I love to work, this is a picture of where I started to work around health IT and I find myself interested in looking at interdisciplinary work uh, where we work with figuring out how technology affects uh, providers and patients at the same time. Uh, so I'm going to speak about three things really and I'm going to use this uh, as a reflection of 2020, which has really brought up a lot of, of work, a focus on the pandemic of COVID, but also a second pandemic of social injustice. And we know that there has been systemic, uh, you know, uh, bias with disproportionate deaths, uh, you know, that affected minority patients who were infected with COVID. And we also noticed that there has been a lot of uptick in the adoption of technology as we've moved on. And so, uh, as we recal recalibrate to this new normal, I want us to first reflect a lot on the topics that have things that we have learned over the last year. You know, we are moving from despair to hope with new vaccines. We have seen an, an increased adoption of technology in our healthcare system. In fact, if you told me that I would be using Zoom to conduct my telehealth visits, that would have been impossible to think about. And even the fact that I can recycle my mask, uh, you know, something that will be impossible to think about in the past. And we have this e consent process using DocuSign, we're shifting care from the hospital to the patient's home. We've had multiple vaccines developed and approved in this last year. And, um, you know, and, and so this, this is the intersect of, how, of what we're dealing with. And so what does this mean when it comes to think about uh, equity, uh, algorithms and fairness? I want to recap that the work that we do is an intersection of, you know, algorithmic level factors and then systemic uh, factors and enterprise level factors. And I hope that I can use this patient journey to help you understand what are some of the things that could happen. Now, let's say you were unfortunate enough to, uh, you know, contract COVID and then ended up in the emergency room. It turns out that the pulse oximeter that they put on your finger to tell you what's the oxygen levels that are available it actually doesn't work very well for black patients. Now, here you can see the red bars are the black patients and the blue bars are the white patients and you can see the median levels. And you can see for all these levels, the, the red bars are lower. And they compared it because we're able to get blood from the uh, artery and this usually has the, um, can also tell you the oxygen levels. So we find that actually, you know, when we look at the levels of, uh, you know, arterial levels of oxygen, they're disparate from the pulse oximeter. And we know that that's because the way the pulse ox works, you know, the darkness of the skin can affect its performance. And so, you know, you may be like, okay, so now we know this, what does this matter? It turns out that at a, you know, at a reading of 88 and, or 89 percent of oxygen, Medicare will reimburse for oxygen at home, but at 90, it will not. So if you have something that's already measuring your oxygen you know, incorrectly, it actually even has, you know, policy implications about who gets care and what coverage they get. And also, where people use this value to discharge patients home uh, last time, uh, you know, when they were going, decide who's going to go on home on oxygen or who's going to get admitted. So something so small with such a big uh, consequence. Now we observed, at least in our population, that quite a number of, pa of patients ended up with renal failure. Now it turns out that one of the things that is used to capture your renal function, it's actually, uh, you know, 
has is calibrated differently for different races. So the glomerular filtration function is reported differently for African Americans and uh, white patients. And I'll sort of delve a little more into this in my talk. Now, if you are even more unfortunate to end up in the ICU, we have these scoring systems called the Apache score, the SOFA score, and the um, OASI score. And we actually noticed that if you have a very high score, you're pretty sick, you know? But the challenging part, and this work we just published in the Lancet Digital Health, is that it's very poorly calibrated and over predicts mortality for black patients and Hispanics. And so this is concerning because if you have one bed or one ventilator, you want to give it to the person, to the person who has most chances of survival. And so you will uh, try, if you rely on this cause, you can actually divert care from patients. And so, uh, you know, I, I hope that some of you got an opportunity to read about this story, which is, you know, the algorithm that actually is developed by Stanford, a, a great place and a giant of AI development, was very uh, inequitable for patients, for people who were younger and doing most of their work in the inpatient service, and they did really pretty much didn't get considered for the vaccine, and so quite a lot of this, you know. Uh, discussion about how to design these systems and what their impact means. Now, beyond what could have happened to you, you could have been attending care in a hospital that's probably, you know, a, a safety net hospital or, a, you know, a, attends to patients who are maybe of low income. And these biases are perpetuated as we start to think of how to train algorithms. And speaking about training algorithms, we know that uh, actually 34 states are not uh, represented of, on any patient on some of the algorithms that are being developed. And when we find out that these algorithms do not work, we do not have a place to talk about where they fail. And so we always maybe will post something on Twitter to show that, well, this didn't work. Now, there is actually a place where we've always used algorithms, not necessarily deep learning, and this is for breast cancer screening. And as you can see, over the time, we've adopted a lot of digital uh, breast cancer c screening and actually using computer-aided uh, diagnosis for mammogramic mammogram screening. And if you look at the black line, which shows the performance of the physician, it's actually better than when they use the CAD system. And but you know what? You get paid if you use the CAD system. And so we see the adoption still going up. And so incentives matter. And, you know, we see quite a lot of vendors who are already providing uh, data in the system say, you know what? I can build an algorithm that predicts race or something or predicts COVID. And so uh, we see a lot of deployment of, of models in the enterprise, but we really, they don't need to get FDA approval because they're clinical decision support tools. And they are, um, we don't have an idea of why, how they work and not necessarily understand how they're calibrated for our population. So the current status is that uh, we, we see quite a, some systems being adopted. There's no regulatory guidance. We don't have a place to talk about uh, failure. Uh, some of these tools come in as an add-on to existing technology stack. And where, you know, their commercial vendors, there is a lot of concern for intellectual property. And we have, you know, this challenge of understanding this black box nature of algorithms. And, um, and as we move to more complex models where we are building models that combine imaging and clinical information, this even become more uh, intransparent. And we understand that, you know, incentives matter. So what are some of the tools that people have been developing to tackle algorithm bias and improve fairness? And, you know, most of them are focused on the actual development of AI system, you know, that these sort of cohorts that, you know, like, for example, the false positive rate, and then you decide where are you going to, what are you going to minimize? Because there's really no ultimate honesty with the uh, with a performance that you can be 100% fair. And so uh, these are some of the toolkits that are actually being used and you can, you know, try them in your work. This is some of the work that we've looked at uh, when we look at chest X-ray, uh, which is an imaging of the chest commonly actually used in COVID. And you can start to see what's the proportion of patients. Uh, if you're above zero, then your positive, the algorithm fares, you know, uh, favors you, and so you can see quite a lot of the dark blues, uh, which are the white patients, are uh, favored by the algorithm, and the other uh, patients in sort of less than zero, so negatively um, favored. And in actually, in this case, what we ended up finding out is that um, you know, positive, uh, you know, that the, there was bias when it comes to sort of black patients, patients who are on Medicaid, uh, which is sort of like uh, the state uh, for patients who may not make enough in income state insurance and uh, zero to 20. And that may be also just the numbers of the patients who are in these groups. Yeah, I'm a radiologist, so we use a lot of uh, 
reptilian sim apps, but honestly, they really don't tell. They just tell us where the model is looking. But as a clinician, I really don't understand what uh, this means. And so, and when we look at the uh, uh, fairness uh, requirements by the most of, most of the guidelines that are out there, it's actually pretty minimal. With a lot of you know people either putting them as footnotes or uh, deciding or um, that they don't explicitly mention of how you should report or uh, address uh, that this. This is fair. And so uh, how are we, how are people trying to solve this? And so one of the most interesting things, and honestly, I think is a big future of AI in healthcare, is to try and use, develop new metrics. And this is the power of the magic of algorithm, you know, a deep learning. And what this uh, team did, and this is what we are going to extend here at Emory, is that they looked at, instead of using a scoring system that's used by radiologists to say, how severe is your arthritis, is that they went back and, Looked, listened to the patient and said, what was the patient's patient, you know, pain score? And then try and uh, tune an, algorithmic, an, an algorithm that would actually uh, be calibrated to the patient's pain score. And with that, they find that they reduce this, you know, disparities for the previous KLG scoring system that, you know, is unfair to patients who are minority, low socioeconomic status, and low income status. So this idea of developing new metrics using algorithm, I think is a fascinating area for research and uh, deserves our attention. And so it turns out listening to patient pays off, even for reading for MRI, where if you sort of, re you know, listen to the patients and try and figure out where they're actually having pain, you actually end up providing better care for them. So a group that is not uh, there. Similar team still worked on uh, developing this, um, evaluating this uh, paper, which is actually a very interesting read if you haven't read it, which is uh, looking at bias in a managed al algorithm that's used to uh, direct to advanced resources for patients who are very sick. And so rather than future costs, what they created was an index variable that combined health prediction with cost prediction, because previously they were using costs, and we know that black patients do not really utilize uh, the healthcare systems in the same patterns as a white patient. So uh, you the time you were referring a black patient, they were way, way sicker because you were using cost as a metric. And by just doing this, they had an 84% reduction in bias. And so I talked about the glomerular filtration rate. And you can see some of the things that, you can see that this requires systemic uh, solutions and multidisciplinary team. And you can see some people are trying to say, let's remove race. And others are saying, you know what? This may be the proxy for social determinants for health that helps us understand better. And so what happens when you sort of start to uh, um, act on this type of data, you start to uh, diagnose levels of chronic kidney disease early. You start to figure out who gets on renal transplant early and even uh, additional coverage is necessary by just trying to start to understand this system. And even from an education point, now we're seeing a lot of work trying to start to challenge people to think about the systems that they build because we understand there are many tensions uh, when it comes to thinking about algorithmic fairness, whether it's fairness versus trust, fairness versus explainability, fairness versus generalizability, and fairness versus performance. And so as we start to think about this, the grand challenge is to come up even with better metrics as an opportunity that's provided think about human factors engineering and align incentives that allow us to be to build fair systems and develop our regulatory frameworks and governance for this and work on the, and incentivize data set curation to think about machine learning models to open the black box and actually consider simulation studies again this is a systemic uh, algorithmic and enterprise problem and so my call to action is for us to engage uh, multiple people to solve this difficult problem collect data on vulnerable populations analyze uh, algorithmic performance, even when they are uh, sold by uh, vendors uh, for different uh, intersection subpopulations at risk of unfair outcomes, and establish thresholds and disparities uh, for model function between groups, be transparent uh, regarding the specific definition of fairness, and explicitly evaluate for disparate treatment and impacts in clinical trials. And we have to commit to you know, doing surveillance uh, for the ongoing real world impact of machine learning models. If you're working in this area, please consider submitting your work and your opinions uh, in this special issue of the BMJ, uh, where we're trying to say, you're not just saying that there's a problem in machine learning. We want to get to the point where we say, look, we want to t tackle this problem, and it takes a, a village to do this. Uh, here is my team here at Emory that I enjoy working with. And if you have questions, please reach out to me.
and uh, I think at this point we'll transition to questions. <laughs>